The Texas Education Agency has an online document of homeschool information and the implication is that if you're going to school your children at home you should follow these standards. And among these are that seventh graders should know that, whoa, should know that changes in traits sometimes occur in a population over many generations and these students are expected to identify examples of these changes through both natural selection and selective breeding. If you attended middle school in Texas, uh, you should have learned this too. Uh, and you should all know this, but don't worry, we're not going to play Are You Smarter Than a 7th Grader. <laughs> we're going to play Are You Smarter Than a Ninth Grader. <laughs> all right, in high school, uh, the lesson plan introduces astronomy and geology, combined under one heading, Earth in Space and Time, wherein... Uh, the student knows how Earth-based and space-based astronomical observations reveal differing theories about the structure, scale, composition, origin, and history of the universe. And the student is expected to evaluate the evidence concerning the Big Bang model, such as redshift and cosmic microwave background radiation, and current theories on the evolution of the universe, including estimates for the age of the universe. Uh, the student understands the solar nebular accretionary disk model, now, let's see, the student knows the difference for how Earth's atmosphere, hydrosphere, and, hydrosphere and geosphere formed and changed over time. This is not advancing. There you go. Okay. Uh, the student knows that scientific dating methods of fossils and rock sequences are used to construct a chronology of Earth's history expressed in the geologic time scale. The student is expected to evaluate relative dating methods using original horizontality, rock superposition, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, unconformities, index fossils, and biozones based on fossil succession to determine chronological order. Calculate the ages of igneous rocks from Earth and Moon me meteorites using radiometric dating methods and understand how multiple dating methods are used to construct the geologic time scale which represent Earth's approximate 4.6 billion year history. Okay? Uh, and the student knows that the fossils provide evidence for geological and biological evolution. Students are expected to analyze and evaluate a variety of fossil types such as transitional fossils, proposed transitional fossils, fossil lineages, and significant fossil deposits with regard to their appearance, completeness, and alignment with scientific explanations in light of this fossil data. Explain how sedimentation, fossilization, and speciation affect the degree of completeness of the fossil record and evaluate the significance of the terminal, Permian, and Cretaceous mass extinction events, including adaptive radiations and of organisms after these events. All very dangerous stuff, right? <laughs> and if you went to high school in Texas, and these are Texas essential knowledge and skills, then this is what you were all taught in public school, right? What a surprise. <laughs> Part of the problem being that we have 20% of our teachers are creationists. The few teachers that we have in the state that will teach evolution are inept to do so in many cases. It's a very difficult thing and those who can teach it, who agree with it, who understand it and are capable of teaching it will very often shy away because the religious organizations have primed students to disrupt the classes whenever their, th their religious beliefs are challenged and the faculty will work against teachers wanting to give a proper education also. And this primarily is why half this country believes in a fable complete with witches, giants, magic spells, and talking animals. <laughs> Leaving astronomy and geology aside for the moment, evolution takes on more focus in what Texas considers essential knowledge and skills in biology, which I'll focus on here. And the science concepts. I, uh, the student knows evolutionary theory is a scientific explanation for the unity and diversity of life. I could also say that evolution is the only theory of biodiversity there is or ever was. Those who want to teach alternative theories should know there aren't any. Uh, the intelligent design creationism meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. 
It is not a field of study because it has no concordant facts and no mechanism. It posits no laws, offers no explanation of any phenomenon, and will not propose any testable hypotheses because it isn't indicated by evidence and isn't falsifiable either. It's an unsupported assertion, uh, assumption asserted on faith alone with no practical application in the real world. Notice also that evolution is an explanation for the diversity of life, but not the origin of life. And why is that? Now this is when and where we need definitions to know exactly what we're talking about when we say evolution. <laughs> the idea some people have to explain life without God, according to Ken Ham, who is obviously no authority on this or anything else. <laughs> and there are no answers in Genesis. Creationists want to say that there's a cosmic evolution and a chemical evolution and an organic evolution and that they're all somehow different aspects of the same thing where life, the universe, and everything created themselves out of nothing without God. And to be fair, some scientists do use the phrase cosmic evolution when they're talking about nothing more than a change over time, but that does not relate to the theory of evolution, which is strictly an aspect of biology and has nothing whatsoever to do with the formation of stars or chemical elements. Unless otherwise specified, the scientific context of evolution always refers to an explanation of biodiversity via population mechanics or genetics, summarily defined as descent with inherent modification. Paraphrased for clarity, and I hope this is clear, it is a process of varying allele frequencies among reproductive populations leading to usually subtle changes in the morphological or physiological composition of any descendant subsets. When compiled over successive generations, these can produce new derivations including new species when continuing variation between genetically isolated groups eventually leads to one or more descendant branches increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins, or if you prefer, descent with inherent modification. <laughs> Evolution is a process, and as you can see, the process by which life diversifies cannot be the same process by which life began. There's a very different string of processes for, processes for the, how the first life emerged. Here again, we have uh, creationists submitting another wrong definition. Uh, I, can you all read this? Is that good enough? Okay. Uh, spontaneous generation was actually a supernatural belief and it was disproved by scientific methodology. Spontaneous generation is not in any way related to the modern concept of how life emerged. Abiogenesis, requiring that the formation of life requires a prior matrix. And this is a very intricate system of probably many different overlapping processes. What is frustrating about this? is that virtually every common dictionary casually describes spontaneous generation as though it were a biogenesis. They make no distinction between them and don't adequately define either one and they never correctly describe the latter. Many of them even say that abiogenesis was disproved, which it was not. And they will not correct their error once they've been made aware of it. So if you do not have access to a scientific dictionary, which is going to be the only source we're going to get either of these words defined correctly, please make note of these two completely different and unrelated concepts. Now, getting back into the meat of it, the student is expected to analyze and evaluate how evidence of common ancestry among groups is provided by the fossil record, biogeography and homologies, including anatomical, molecular, and developmental. Here it is important not only to know what evolution is and how it works, but also what sort of patterns it follows. Uh, there are a number of natural laws at work within evolution, just as there are in any scientific theory. Uh, famed biologist Ernst Mayer identified two of Darwin's original laws of evolution, which explain patterns indicated, uh, indicating common ancestry. Okay. First of all, contrary to creationism's all-time favorite straw man fallacy, evolution never suggests nor permits that one thing ever turned into another fundamentally different thing. Nor is it possible to grow out of one's ancestry. So every new species or genus, etc., that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. 
as you can see with this morphological comparison of humans, chimpanzees, and one, the first of many links that has not been missing since, uh, well, 40 years ago. Uh, and to comprehend evolutionary theory, one must first understand that it, it is only ever a variation of anatomical or biochemical proportions, altering or enhancing existing features to build on what is already there, and those developments may subsequently provide a platform for future adaptations. Developmental biology, genetics, and comparative morphology combine to confirm many of these taxonomic stages such that organs do not appear to have abru appeared abruptly or fully formed as if out of nowhere because there is an implied evolutionary origin evident in every case. Even the transition of fish to tetrapods, dinosaurs to birds, or apes, ape to men are each a, just a matter of incremental superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. And those successive levels of similarity represent taxonomic clades which encompass all the descendants of that clade. So birds descend from dinosaurs, but they are still dinosaurs now. You never grow out of your ancestry. So taxonomy offers one indication of ancestry and the fossil record reveals another. But again, you have to know what pattern you're looking for. <laughs> and that's not it. <laughs> Creationists argue that the common ancestor of two modern species would look like some strange hybrid between them. But of course, they say this without any acknowledgment of deep time or knowledge of the abundance of the fossil species known so far. There are way more genera that have gone extinct than are alive now and are now known only from fossils. They do not still exist today. And virtually everything counts as a transitional species uh, when their traits are compared in chronological order because what really happens is the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar all these complex organisms are. For example, uh, in the top right hand corner, uh, we have an animal that is basal to all modern birds. It comes earlier than any avian group that still exists today and has, tr has traits that are more primitive than any modern bird. We have so many transitional species in that lineage that I had to delete a dozen of them just to fill this, this illustration onto the page. Likewise, on the top left, we have one of many extinct ancestors of today's crocodilians, including the alligator. Now, as you can see, if you trace both lineages back in time, you'll eventually find the template of all archosaurs extant or extinct. And remember that creationists who proposed the crocoduck weren't just unaware of this uh, fluid transition of species, they're prohibited from admitting that any of these forms even exist as a part of this apparent pattern. And we can still go on from there. We now have this sort of evident sequential transition for every major animal group, and some of them, including manatees and men, are effectively complete, meaning there are no links still missing because of all these, all these significant gaps have been closed just in the past few decades. And remember that uh, we don't just have some inexplicable implied procession. We have the mechanism that makes it work. We know it works. We know how it works. And we've seen it at work, not just at the microevolutionary level within species, but with emerging species at the macroevolutionary level, again, observed dozens of times under controlled conditions, both in the lab and in the field. Biogeography gives us another illustration of how this diversity occurs. These are ring species. They're so named because of the uniquely distinct variants capable of interbreeding with their closest neighbors. But as they circumnavigate this particular valley and finally closed the gap on the other side, their genomes had accumulated enough unique mutations that they were no longer chemically interfertile. Uh, there are actually several examples of this sort of thing. This is just the easiest to illustrate, which makes it a favorite. Likewise, the tetrapod forelimb is a favorite example of anatomical homology, uh, where there were uh, truly unique structures, such as a, uh, there were no truly unique structures, such as a magical creator could have and certainly would have devised. Instead, every adaptation requires that the animal make do with what it has and build a wing or a foot or a flipper out of that. And in each case, they have the same bones, just in different proportions. Okay. In the fossil record, we also see these bone configurations developing into lobe-boned or lobe-finned fish 
and we see some bones diminishing too, like when hooved animals reduce the number of toes they have, or when snakes lost their legs. Did you know snakes had legs? Who knew? They still can't talk though. <laughs> Of course, there are homologies in genetics, too. Just look at this illustrated depiction of homology that found between the human and chimpanzee genome. Notice the second set has two chimp chromosomes paired to just one of ours. And remember that Dr. Ken Miller, who is a Christian, by the way, identified that this is precisely where two ape chromosomes fused in the human ancestral line. And I had the advantage of having a biology teacher whose contributions to the Human Genome Project were featured in Nature. And I'd like to share with you something that she told me in an email. The evidence of taxonomic relationships is overwhelming. When you look at the comparisons between genomic DNA sequences of both closely related and even distantly related species, the DNA of yeast and humans shares over 30% homology. Uh, with regard to gene sequences. Comparison of the human and mouse genome shows that only 1% of the genes in either genome fails to have an ortholog in the other genome. Comparison of non-gene sequences, on the other hand, shows a huge amount of divergence. This type of homology can be explained only from descent from a common ancestor. The probability of these things being a coincidence, which I guess would be the argument of creationism and intelligent design, is statistically so small as to be negligible. And incidentally, these are the words of a Christian too. In fact, the director of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collin, was a Christian as well. There are many leading evolutionary biologists throughout history who have been Christian. So there's no real dichotomy wherein you either accept evolution or you believe in God. Most people tend to mix degrees of both perspectives. But what is most important to understand about education and evolution is that we're not talking about beliefs. We're talking about matters of knowledge, things we can actually see and measure and trace and confirm. We're talking about matters of fact. Our genome is riddled with dysfunctional primate genes. And some of these damaged, deleted, or deactivated genes have actually been linked to advantageous adaptations. Likewise, chickens still have a dormant gene whose uh, function is to create teeth. There is no reason for that except as a molecular vestige of a saurian ancestry. Similarly, Whale embryos partially develop hind legs before absorbing them again, and evolution is the only explanation for that, too. So common ancestry can be indicated by genotype as well as by phenotype, but there is homology in embryology also. As you track any evident lineage backward through fossil sequences, the closer you get to the crown or the origin of any one clade, the more basal forms will resemble progenitors of their sister clades because the further back you go, the more closely related they are. And in a microcosm of that same pattern, two, the young of uh, two closely related species will look more alike than the adults do. And this trend continues in embryology too. Ernst Haeckel recognized this pattern, but he didn't understand the reason. He proposed a biogenetic law that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, meaning that developing fetus mirrors its evolution such that it becomes a fish, an amphibian, a reptile, and so on before becoming a mammal. He drew hundreds of embryos fairly accurately, but there were some he enhanced to exaggerate certain traits or that he drew from imagination with no visual references. In science, this is equivalent to fraud. However, however close he got, doesn't matter. The, uh, Explanation was still wrong. Recapitulation has been refuted long ago and recently replaced by a more accurate study of the parallels of embryological and evolutionary development, colloquially known as Evo Devo. Now, analyze and evaluate scientific explanations concerning any data of sudden appearance, stasis, and sequential nature of gaps in the fossil record. The fossil record shows bacterial microfossils throughout the Proterozoic era, dating back to as much as 3.5 billion years old. Uh, in the late Cambrian, we see trace fossils of tiny tunnels and tracks of soft-bodied worm-like things. 
And uh, as soon as life went multicellular, there was an explosion of different forms experimenting with all the different type configurations that could possibly work. Many of them didn't. But those who did led to all of the animal phyla that we still have today. This implied phylogeny, in, uh, this implied phylogeny in particular, spanned most of the Cambrian era, which lasted about 50 million years. Now, creationists like to say that all of the major types of animals existed all at once. But of course, that's, that's not right either. There were no insects in this set, for example. And all of the, uh, the vertebrates, the group that includes mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and fish, were represented by a very few tiny progenitors no more advanced than this. That's it. That's the whole representation of vertebrata in the early Cambrian. <laughs> now, some studies have identified different species of tunicates, for example, which evolve measurably faster than their sister taxa. Other forms are remarkably stable, and this seems to be a genetic stability. There are also morphological types that are so effective that once achieved, there can be little improvement. It is also relatively rare that new conditions emerge or force a dramatic change, but when that happens, like when vertebrates made the transition onto land, there were several intermediate forms whose versatility left them not as well adapted for either environment, and so these forms tend not to last that long. This would be Gould's principle of punctuated equilibrium. Now, as far as the, oh, is it not gonna play? Here we go. As far as the sequential nature of evolutionary groups, I must point out that in the 30 odd years or so since this animation came out, that every predicted stage of this sequence has been verified, either in embryological development or according to a conserved genetic orthologue, and uh, several of the important links have been found in chronological order in the fossil record. There are some minor changes, but effectively this prediction in this cartoon has been confirmed correct. There are some trivial de you know, derivations, but they're not significant. It is fair to say that this entire sequence is now represented well enough that there are no significant links still missing. Now, next up. Analyze and evaluate how natural selection produces changes in populations and not individuals. And the best way that I could illustrate evolution is on the population level is by using the analogy of how languages evolve. Now, if you uh, look over here, more or less on the left, uh, you'll see uh, Italian. And this is uh, obviously a chart showing the major de or the derivation of the major types from a single common ancestor. And just like a biological cladogram, it is simplified, eliminating most of the final products. As, the, as well as the intermediates. And uh, where you see Italian, we realize that it is derived from Latin, which is not listed on here, and that Latin is now extinct. Over time, Latin became Italian. And this type of direct succession is called anagenesis. Uh, and, but most evolution is in the form of cladogenesis, where one ancestor leads to multiple descendants. And in this analogy, that would be where Latin also led to French, Spanish, Romanian, and eventually Portuguese. Next up, uh, analyze and evaluate how the elements of natural selection, including inherited variation, uh, the potential of a population to produce more offspring than can survive, and a finite supply of environmental resources result in differential reproductive success. The subheading is just asking for a summary of natural selection. Okay. Living things produce more offspring than the finite resources available to them can support. Thus, they face a constant struggle for existence. Uh, individuals vary in their phenotypes, and some of this variation is inheritable, a reflection of variations in genotype. Uh, those variants, best adapted to their conditions of their life, are most likely to survive and reproduce themselves, survival of the fittest. To the extent that their adaptations are inheritable, they will be passed on to their offspring. The forces of natural select and action act on phenotypes, but only if there is a change in the genotype of a population has evolution occurred. Okay. Now what this implies about the necessity of gods or miracles isn't the only reason that creationists object to this lesson. It's also what it says about those best suited to the environment. It reminds us that our resources are limited and that we have a responsibility 
and that if we continue to dominate and subdue the earth as we've been doing, we will eventually devise our own demise. Now, creationists will not be held accountable, and this is why anthropogenic climate change is yet another subject creationists want to protest in the classroom. Now, analyze and evaluate the relationship of natural selection to adaptation and the development of diversity in and among species. This is the one area of, of evolution that I think everybody's already got a good grasp of. Uh, it's not always about surviving, it's about thriving. It's a matter of simple population mechanics that those, li those lineages with even the slightest advantage will proliferate beyond those who have more of a struggle or have fewer resources. Different regions will have different demands and those who inherit a greater advantage will become more abundant in those areas. Now, analyze and evaluate the effects of other evolutionary mechanisms including genetic drift, gene flow, mutation, and recombination. These are the mechanisms of evolution. Recombination refers to how much, or, uh, how much of all of your collective grandparents' genes will be inherited by you and passed on to your grandchildren and so on. Mutations are where we get the next level of variation after that. If you've already seen some of my other videos, they've identified some specific mutations that actually do add new genetic de novo information and increase complexity. Remember that humans have an average of 128 mutations per zygote right at the moment of conception, and that significant heritable mutations occur with almost regular frequency when viewed over many generations. So mutations accumulate, meaning that the genome is always changing but recombination acts as a control to keep it limited. The larger the gene pool, meaning the bigger the interbreeding population, the more stable it will be and the slower it will, it will evolve. But if you divide that population into isolated groups and cut off the gene flow between them, the expression of new mutations will be less restricted and unique traits will more rapidly emerge. This is genetic drift, and it is actually a bigger factor in evolution than natural selection or sexual selection. Next, uh, analyze and evaluate scientific explanations concerning the complexity of the cell. Now, at the high school level, they only discuss the anatomy of the cell, which I will spare you here. Uh, I should note, however, that in its most basic, life is simply chemistry. The elements which form basic cell structures, for example, create a phospholipid bilayer automatically upon contact with water due to their combined polarity. Even the function of transport vesicles and other minuscule but critical elements within a cell all act in accordance with their chemical properties. For example, DNA is created by RNA as an enzyme, but how do you get RNA? A few years ago there was an experiment uh, wherein sugars and phosphates were subjected to a repeating cycle of inundation, dehydration, and radiation. And they showed that after every repetition, these became increasingly complex, increase in complexity, until, I hate to use this word, but that's the word they used in the interview, RNA, ribonucleotides, spontaneously generated. Even though science still hasn't figured out all of the overlapping se sequential events that led to the formation of life, we know that uh, there have never been any trace fossils for microscopic life forms prior to 700 million years ago, but there have been oodles of bacterial microfossils covering another 2.8 billion years prior to the first multicellular anythings we've ever found a trace of. And the only possible conclusion we can draw from all that is that life was only microscopic and microbial for the first 80% of the history of the life on this planet. And anything showing emergent properties from replicating feedback is likely to get really complex under those conditions. Now, science concepts. The student knows that taxonomy is a branching classification based on shared characteristics of organisms and can change as new discoveries are made. Uh, one new discovery worth mentioning at this point is that at the level of single-celled organisms, while you do have evolution going on, there's something else happening too. Individual microbes tend to get genetic material directly from each other through a process of horizontal gene transfer, swapping or contaminating their genes by direct contact with communicable microbes. This happens with multicellular organisms too, but the occurrence and the effect are both much reduced. For example, the mitochondria of animals and, uh, and, animals and fungi and the chloroplast of plants 
were evidently both taken directly from bacteria and were not inherited from them. The first eukaryotes apparently enveloped some prokaryote cell in a process called endosymbiosis. And uh, what this means is that the phylogenetic tree of life doesn't have a trunk or a root. It grows out of a web-like mesh of microbial relationships which are not exclusively evolutionary. It's only after that point, at the multicellular level, that life becomes a branching tree pattern. Next. The student is expected to define taxonomy and recognize the importance of a standardized taxonomic system to the community. Now, the first thing I want to say about this is that uh, when my wife was being ridiculed on a radio show recently, the, uh, the creationist talk show host was making fun of her for saying that Ken Ham was an ape and said that the taxonomic system by which we make this determination was invented by men. I often hear this argument that it's all human made and, and thus contrived according to our biases. But this system, taxonomy, was first created by a creationist, Carolus Linnaeus, some 300 years ago, uh, who challenged the scientific community of his time. And he said, my challenge to you and the whole world is to find one diagnostic trait by which to distinguish man from ape. I most assuredly know of none. Now the response was to arbitrarily contrive a separate classification for apes called Pongo. And then once we, uh, once we had achieved a knowledge of genetics, we were able to refute that and realize that Pongo is now just been reclassified for orangutans and we ourselves belong to the superfamily Hominoidea along with the rest of the great apes. Now, one of the things you get with, oh, here we go. This is the genomic analysis. I forgot about this one. Uh, a means of overlapping the genome to, uh, to trace uh, the origins and this is the same exact technology that you would use to identify whether you are the father on the Maury Povich show. <laughs> if it works at that level, it works at the other level. It is the same thing that is confirming our ancestral relationships. Now, there are two things that it does. When we do a morphological analysis, uh, we come up with one scheme, and it might be misinterpreted. It could be. There are, so there's potential for error there. And let's see if I can... Got it. Okay. So this is what we have when you remember that 99% of all the species that have ever lived are now extinct, and we're going to try to make a morphological analysis out of these, and we're going to come up with some conflicting ideas. It's possible that we could do that. But then when you can map the genome and you've got two related individuals or you've got two individuals that you have a complete genome, you can trace them both using that, mechanism, that uh, pattern I just showed you and you come up with something more like that. And this will show confirmation of what Linnaeus had already figured out 300 years ago and it can also show corrections as well. Now, we're going to categorize organisms using a hierarchical, hierarchical classification system based on similarities and differences shared among groups. Once again, this is completely <laughs> objective. If you're going to categorize any collective, you take a total tally of traits held in common by every member already universally accepted in that group in order to determine whether some new addition legitimately belongs there or to determine whether your classification is independently valid. It does not matter what your religious perspective is. It doesn't matter what your faith is. It doesn't matter what you would rather believe. It doesn't matter what your biases are. If you compare, the, if you follow this simple rule of taking the tally of all the traits to do the classification, absolutely everybody is going to come up with this kind of classification. It's inevitable. It's factual. It's independently verified. Now, this next one. If I can get it to move. Okay. Compare the characteristics of what I, I lost it here. Okay. One second. Compare characteristics of taxonomic groups including archaea, bacteria, protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Again, I'm going to spare you the biology lesson. I've already been told I'm running out of time. A eukaryote uh, simply is an organism with nucleic cells. I got into an argument with a young earth creationist who claimed to be a government scientist, but also claimed that I was using too many big words. He, 
He argued that he was not a eukaryote because a eukaryote was an organism and that meant that it only had one cell. <laughs> and, it, and he didn't care how many nucleuses he had or didn't have. He was also said it was not an animal, but an animal is a metazoan, meaning a multicellular organism with an internal digestive tract. And he couldn't argue that he had that too. Likewise, nobody in this room is going to argue that they're not a vertebrate. You've got a backbone, you've got, you're a mammal, you've got mammary glands. That you are a primate may be a little ambiguous for some of you. There's a very long <laughs> description I've given before and I'm not going to recite again here. Uh, and that you are an ape. Now, a lot of people want to argue this point. Now, this is a molecular phylogeny of living primates. This is a genomic analysis which serves as a confirmation of what Carolus Linnaeus recognized three centuries ago. And what this says is it does not matter what you believe, regardless what your religious perspective is, whether God exists or not. <laughs> Teach evolution is a fact, because that's what it is. Thank you.